How are some of these criminals just so dis? Despicable and heartless. Let's get right to it, starting with number five Ami in a Hellcat Revisited. YouTuber Bill Omar Carrasquillo ran one of the most successful TV piracy schemes that federal officials ever prosecuted. Carrasquillo ran the Omni in a Hellcat YouTube channel where he shared slick videos set to hip hop beats in which he showed off his extensive jewelry, his New Jersey mansion, and his fleet of high end luxury cars. He also ran Gears TV and Gears Reloaded, a multi-million dollar business where Carrasquillo and two accomplices opened dozens of Comcast and Verizon Fios accounts so they could hack the encrypted cable boxes. Then they streamed and resold the copyrighted content such as on-demand movies and TV shows which they made accessible to their own subscribers over the internet for $15 a month. Carrasquillo's scheme attracted over 100,000 subscribers before federal authorities shut it down in 2019. He was indicted in September 2021 and pleaded guilty to copyright infringement and tax fraud. Carrasquillo formally apologized to his family, employees, and the companies he defrauded, saying he didn't realize the scope of his crime until his arrest. He received a five and a half year prison sentence and was ordered to forfeit over the money he personally took home from his business. $30 million and $11 million in restitution to the cable companies. The crazy thing is, there was a moment in time he really thought that he wasn't doing anything wrong. Really. He had said, quote, I don't think I ever did anything wrong. Obviously, I was running businesses wide open in the public. Now we are going to have our day in court. Carrasquillo also failed to report his business earnings to the IRS between 2016 and 2019, meaning he owed an additional $5.7 million in back taxes. Federal authorities froze the YouTuber's bank accounts during a 2019 raid and seized his collection of Porsches, McLarens, Lamborghinis, and Bentleys, as well as the over four dozen properties he owned in Philadelphia and the nearby suburbs. His Audi R8, 2019 Mercedes-Benz, BMW M8, and AMG GT63S were some of the vehicles included in an online auction put on by U.S. Marshals. However, the marquee lot in the auction was a Carrasquillo's 2019 Lamborghini, which had several Power Rangers etched onto its rainbow-colored body. The vehicle featured the Mighty Morphin logo, the original green and yellow Rangers, and the Red Ranger from Power Rangers in Space. It sold for $380,000. Other car sales included a white 2020 Lamborghini Huracan for $209,000, a 2020 Bentley Continental for $150,000, and a police grade 2017 Chevrolet Tahoe for $34,000. Despite him getting in trouble, he's continued showing off on Instagram as well as having released a shoe line. Although they aren't the most attractive shoes on the market, they actually look like some off-brand shoe you'd find at Burlington, but at least he's trying to repay the millions of dollars that he owes. Any sneaker heads out there? What do you think of the shoes? Let us know in the comments. Number four, fair trade. Kadriana Hall and Serenity Banks shoplifted from a nail supply store, but returned minutes later when one of them realized she dropped her cell phone. The two women went into the California store and roughed up the owner as they ransacked the shelves. Then the two fled the scene, leaving the owner to tend to his minor injuries. Minutes later, one of these bright pillars of society realized that they dropped one of their cell phones with one of those cases that holds your cards and ID, which like, what are you gonna do, you know? So not wanting to get caught, they returned to the store to retrieve it. The owner actually found the phone and said he would hand it over if they returned the stolen goods, which is actually incredibly reasonable considering what just happened. Well, the women weren't into that idea of being reasonable as well, and one of the women hit him a second time, despite the fact that the phone was worth twice the value of what they stole. The two left the scene in a black vehicle, and the police contacted them minutes later when they were sitting in the car outside their home about a mile from the store. The stolen merchandise was in plain sight inside the vehicle, so they got arrested. Would you have gone back? for the phone though you kind of have to right what would you have done let us know in the comments number three faked investments Financial planner Terence Nugara swindled $10 million from clients in fake investments. Nugara tricked 28 clients into investing $10 million from their savings and retirement accounts. The disgraced financial planner convinced his clients to move their 401k and social security savings into private self-managed accounts and invest in real estate development, which isn't exactly terrible financial advice, but there was a hiccup. 
Nugara's clients thought he was a property developer who had properties all around Australia and in Bali. Nugara had promised returns as high as 98.93% for their investments, which is crazy. He had pre-existing relationships with many of his victims, and he worked hard to earn their trust. The con artist even brought one of his victims flowers and took her out to lunch. He worked with another woman who began working with him when her husband passed away. Nugara also lured a man and his parents into investing in his scam. Rather than put the money towards investments, Nugara used it to fund his excessive lifestyle. He had a garage filled with expensive luxury vehicles and owned a boat and helicopter. Nugara's victims eventually learned the truth about his scheme in multiple ways. Several clients realized he was a scammer when they visited one of the supposedly developed properties and discovered the original building still hadn't been demolished. Another victim learned of the scam when a financial watchdog advised him to contact the police, and another found out through her lawyer. The police opened an investigation into Nagara's scheme, but he had already fled the country. Before he left, he got rid of all his assets, including his house, with plans to start over again overseas. But his international business ventures failed, and he returned to Australia, where he was arrested and charged with 27 offenses, including two charges of theft. He was sentenced to 10 years in jail. And why on earth would he return after leaving? Number two, lining her pockets. Black Lives Matter organizer Zara Salim raised thousands of dollars to help fund protests, and somehow that money went missing. Salim set up a crowdfunding page to raise money for things like face masks and other necessary equipment as the protests occurred in June 2020 during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Salim was a part of the BLM in Bristol, England, which garnered international attention when the crowd threw the statue of slave trader Edward Colston into the river. After the incident, Salim's crowdfunding page raised tens of thousands of dollars, reaching 30 $6,000. Salim had promised that any excess funds would go to Changing Your Mindset Limited, a youth group that helped young people go on trips to Africa. However, none of the money made it to the charity. Many accused Salim, who changed her name to Yvonne Mena, of using the money for herself. The police conducted an investigation into Salim and finally arrested her. She pleaded not guilty to fraud, but later changed her plea to guilty. We can all agree that stealing donations that were intended to help those in need makes the crime a little bit worse, doesn't it? Hey, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how this psychopath scammed her and then buried her alive. Number one, betrayed. Bitter ex-wife Colleen Campbell sold out her gangster ex-husband to his rivals to arrange an ambush that left him no longer among the living. The former cashier enjoyed a lavish lifestyle with her husband, Thomas Campbell, for almost 10 years, but their marriage ended when he cheated on her with one of her friends after a two-year stint in prison. Despite his time behind bars, Thomas was an integral gang member, but created an enemy in John Belfield when he started a relationship with John's ex-girlfriend. So John contacted Colleen, and the pair plotted their revenge against Thomas. John and his accomplice went after Thomas late on a Saturday night as he returned home from a night of clubbing. The pair went to work on John, who passed away from his injuries. Colleen played the part of a grieving widow and poured her heart out to Thomas's family about how much she missed him and his entire family embraced her and comforted her. A few days later, she told Thomas's mother that his ghost visited her to talk about the details of his passing, which Colleen shared with her mother-in-law. Colleen was eventually arrested for her involvement in Thomas's passing. She claimed that she thought they were only going to steal two of her late husband's Rolex watches, and that's why she gave them the details of his typical daily routine and home address. Daniel, Thomas's brother, wrote a victim impact statement where he called out Colleen for showing no remorse for her actions and deliberately hiding her involvement in his brother's passing. He added that she manipulated her children by telling them that she would be home soon and they would be a family again. Although her kids were from a previous marriage, they considered Thomas to be their father. The kids are living with with Daniel while Colleen awaits her verdict and sentencing as of the release of this video. The latest Netflix true crime miniseries is called Worst Roommate Ever, and it'll make you rethink the severity of all your horrible roommate experiences. Instead of focusing on one criminal for the entire series, like in The Tender Swindler or Bad Vegan, Worst Roommate Ever focuses on a new criminal per episode. Episode 3, Marathon Man, is about a Texas woman named Callie Quinn who moved to Chile in 2011. Little did she know that her new roommate, Youssef Halter, was a serial fraudster. Some of his crimes included scamming Palestinian charities, stealing money from his housemates, and even trying to bury Callie alive. He only served 602 days in jail before being sent to Denmark in 2014 
where he served another three months. Once out, Yusef adopted several fake identities to keep scamming people. But this was just the beginning. Yusef's story runs much deeper than you could ever imagine. There are two sides to every coin. In this instance, the coin is the relationship between Yusef and Kali. Yusef was the oldest of the housemates. He identified as a Palestinian, born in Israel, but raised in Denmark. After spending a few years in the Palestinian Special Forces, he moved to Chile under the Federation Palestine de Chile, an organization representing Chile's largest Palestinian population, the largest outside of Palestine. As an impressive athlete, the organization sponsored Youssef to break the world record running the 2,653-mile length of Chile. Youssef told his housemates about his intense physical training with the Danish Special Forces during meals and downtime. That training included standing in a room full of mace or swimming to the bottom of a 40-foot deep pool. Two of the housemates, Ed and Sabi, loved listening to his stories. Callie just rolled her eyes. Callie was a bright-eyed girl who moved to Chile for her love of travel, sense of adventure, and the easy visa process. She taught English and moved into a 12-bedroom house that seemed more like a hostel. She became friends with all her housemates, except for Yusef, who complained that she talked too much. But even Callie had to admit that Yusef seemed like an impressive guy. When one of his friends or housemates got sick, he would run to the grocery store to make them a vitamin C smoothie. He gave away the sportswear he received from his sponsors, administered free acupuncture to friends, and gathered his housemates for random movie nights with chocolate. Kali was starting to come around to Yusef. According to Yusef, he was born to a hard-working mother and a cruel father. Yusef was one of five children. In school, he was a popular, athletic kid who began running marathons at 11. When his parents separated, he joined the Danish infantry at 18 and became one of the few selected for the special forces. But he was a wanted man in Denmark. Even after charges were brought against him with plenty of evidence, Yusef maintained his innocence with the stone-cold demeanor of a psychopath. One day, Yusuf mentioned to Kelly that he had just bought two new condos downtown and offered to rent them out to her and another housemate, Molly. He offered them a low price, and they accepted for just $1,000, which included the first month's rent and security deposit. The day before move-in, Callie set up a meeting with Yusef to get the keys to her new place. Yusef arrived late to their meeting because he was apparently planning a search and rescue mission for three Danish women stranded in the Atacama Desert. Pretty noble, huh? Yusef invited Callie out for dinner after and was surprised to find that she enjoyed his company. When their housemate Sabi called him, Callie could hear that she was upset. Yusef owed Sabi money and hadn't paid her back for several months. He promised to send the money back to the house with Callie. During dinner, Yusef talked about a house that burned down in town that apparently had a golden toilet. He suggested they go and find it, and Callie agreed. They snuck into the burnt home, and as soon as Callie saw the regular beige toilet seat, she turned to leave. She had to be up early for work the next day, and it was already getting late. Then, Yusef attacked her. He went on and on about owing people money and that it was all Callie's fault. Callie passed out and Yusef left her there, never expecting her to return. A frantic Sabi was nervous because Callie hadn't answered her calls in hours. Callie was supposed to be bringing home the money Yusef owed her, nearly $1,000. She heard Yusef come home and start knocking on everyone's doors, asking if they'd seen Callie. Another housemate, Ed, suddenly saw Callie in her long puffy coat in the distance. He and Yusef ran outside. Callie began yelling at Yusef immediately, asking how he could do that to her. Sabi and Molly saw Callie's wounded head and called a cab to the hospital. Callie told them everything. After Yusef left her unconscious, Callie dreamed her family was screaming at her to wake up. She finally snapped awake to find she'd been wrapped in a tarp, stuffed in a closet, and buried beneath a foot of ash. Molly and Ed wanted to believe her but thought she must have been confused. Yusef could never do something like that. Ed and Sabi returned to the house. Yusef pretended to be sympathetic when they described what happened to Callie, but denied the attack. Yusef told Molly that his mother had died in the middle of the night and he needed to go back to Denmark. He disappeared without a trace. The next day, Callie woke up still coughing up ash. She had Molly file a police report on her behalf. A man came to take Callie's information, but she had difficulty remembering the entire story. To outsiders, it didn't make sense. If Yusef tried to hurt her, why weren't there bruises on her neck? Why would he get violent over such a small sum of money? The report noted the incident as a dispute between two foreigners. In the meantime, Molly tried to get in touch with Callie's family. 
Finally, she reached her brother John on Facebook. Callie's parents received word of the attack and Skyped with their injured daughter. They wanted to hop on a plane and see her, but Callie said no. She couldn't risk it with Yousef still on the loose. But this is only the midpoint of Yousef's story. Let's go back to the beginning. Carlos Medina was a member of the Federación Palestina and an avid Chilean soccer fan. Medina and his friend Carlos Kraus helped raise $8,000 to sponsor Yousef in the Atacama race, a 155-mile race through the Atacama Desert in Chile. Medina and Kraus were excited to show a different side of the Palestinian people. But on the second day of the race, Yousef dropped out, saying that the marathon organizers noticed a tear in his leg and forced him to exit the course. Yousef said it was racially motivated, so Medina and Kraus took Yousef to get the tear examined by a doctor and prove wrongdoing. When the diagnosis came in, no muscle tear, Yousef stopped responding to their texts and calls. Medina and Kraus contacted Yousef's friend, Dominic Rayner, a fellow marathon marathoner from England who said Yousef owed him money. Rayner previously bought him $12,000 worth of Under Armour gear and paid $38,000 to purchase properties in Brazil that Yousef suggested they could invest in together. The real estate broker kept giving excuses for why he couldn't send Raynar a receipt and then accidentally signed one email as Yousef. Rayner demanded his money, and Yousef gave him two options. The money could be wired to him, or he could come to Chile and get it. Rayner decided to meet Yusuf at the airport in Chile, but of course, Yusuf was nowhere to be found. Twelve hours later, Yusuf met Rayner in the city and took him on a walk to show him where he was living. It was the house that Callie would move into two weeks later. The next day, Yusuf took him on a three-hour hike to the city's outskirts where their lawyer worked. At one point, Rayner dropped down to tie his shoe. Then, Yusuf charged at him with a walking stick and struck him. Yusuf charged at Rayner and was about to take his life when he noticed two people watching nearby. He pushed Rayner into a ditch and urged him not to tell anyone what happened. He told Rayner that he spent all his money, a total of $55,000. Rayner left Santiago the next day and filed a report with the British Metropolitan Police Service and Interpol. No one knew where Yousef was hiding. Criminal attorney Rocco Berrios heard Medina, Rayner, and Callie's stories and wanted to track down Yusuf. It seemed like everywhere he went, money disappeared. He stole cash from a friend's bag and blamed the hostile owner. Then he persuaded a Norwegian athlete to invest $10,000 in property in Brazil and then stole the cash. He even convinced people in Denmark to transfer $28,000 to purchase flights and then kept the money for himself. Yusef's crime spree was documented across Denmark. Though arrested in 2009 for several of his crimes, he failed to appear in court for his trial in January 2011. He was still wanted for arson, embezzlement, forgery, and fraud. Palestinian activist Mahar Khatib heard about Yousef's crimes and was furious at how he was damaging the reputation of the Palestinian people. After tons of research, he found Yousef's sister on Facebook, who was a lawyer in Copenhagen. As soon as she picked up the phone, she started crying, saying that Yousef had destroyed her entire family's lives. Not only that, but he created an entire web of lies. He wasn't born in Haifa. He was born in Beirut. He wasn't even Palestinian. He was Lebanese. Berrios communicated all of this to Yousef's victims via email. Together, they figured out the perfect plan. They discovered that Yusuf had just written to his ex-girlfriend asking for money for an arm and leg amputation. If she wired him the money, the police could get him when he picked it up. But the night before the transfer, Yusuf told his ex he was sending a Taiwanese sponsor named Lin Chai Min to pick up the cash instead. Officers tracked Chai Min to a Chile Express money agency where they found Yusuf sitting in the car and arrested him. Two days before Callie's 24th birthday, she received an email from Berrio saying, we got him. But still, he denied attacking Cali. A psychologist saw him at Santiago Uno jail, awaiting trial without bail. After many tests and interviews, Yousef admitted to striking Cali in the head, but said he never intended to hurt her. He just wanted to confuse her into thinking he had returned her condo deposit. The psychologist said that Yousef displayed narcissistic, paranoid, and asocial traits. He lacked empathy and used his friends. He showed many of the classic psychopathic traits. He was charismatic, egotistical, promiscuous, and a liar. Most importantly, he had no conscience. Yousef was basically out of prison in three years between his sentences in Chile and Denmark. In Chile, there are two kinds of attempted murder charges. One is for those who try to hurt someone and fail. The other is for one who have a plan and then abort the mission. The latter carries a much softer penalty. 
Berrios believed Yusef was guilty of the first charge, but tried to prove the second because the witnesses, aka Callie's old housemates, were scattered around the world and couldn't testify. On the other hand, Yusef's attorney believed he could win him a short sentence because he was a first-time offender in Chile. Berrios showed the judge Yusef's criminal record from Denmark, but it had little effect. The judge sentenced Yusef to 541 days for attempted murder and 61 days for fraud. Yusef, however, had already served more than half of his sentence while awaiting trial. After prison in Chile, he was extradited to Denmark, facing five more charges. Unfortunately, they acquitted Yusef of three charges and released him three months later. One September day, Callie received an email from Barrios with a link to a news article about Yusef. He apparently fled to Costa Rica, where he met a Canadian traveler named Sheena Taylor and scammed her out of $19,000. Taylor was a down-on-her-luck single mother, and Yusef was just what she needed. He held a birthday party for her daughter, brought her breakfast in bed, and took her shopping. But there were some red flags, like when Yusuf said he could leave her in the jungle and nobody would find her, or when he pressed a pillow to her face. But she looked past these things because of the happiness Yusuf brought her. Hmm. One day, Yusuf never returned to their room in the hostel. A concerned tailor went to the bank only to discover that someone had drained her bank account. Yusuf took her bank card and memorized her pen. All her savings were gone. When he arrived in Capos, Costa Rica the previous June, Yusuf adopted the alias Joseph Carter so no one discovered his real identity. He asked a Texan-born store owner, Todd Flanders, to spot him for $3,500 of Under Armour clothes, promising that his sponsors would reimburse him later. Flanders was known around the town of Capos for his incredible generosity and big personality. When Yusef told Flanders that thieves stole $10,000 from him, Flanders agreed to spot him during a tough time. The two became friends and went to a boxing gym together. When Flanders told Yusef that he was getting divorced and fighting for custody of his children, Yusef offered to help by getting a hold of secondhand cell phones that Flanders could sell at his shop and use the profits for legal fees. But the cell phones never arrived, and neither did the money from Yusef's sponsors. Taylor found Flanders by tracing one of Yusef's sportswear packages. Taylor and Flanders started piecing together Yusef's story through Danish and Chilean newspaper articles. When Flanders confronted Yusef on WhatsApp, he stopped responding. Flanders and Taylor reported Yusef to Costa Rica's FBI. But just like Callie's case, they dismissed Yusef's activities as disputes between foreigners. When Callie heard about this, she was heartbroken. After everything she went through, Yusef was still at it, destroying people's lives. Callie emailed Taylor, who never responded. Then Callie found out that Flanders took his own life after losing one daughter and a fierce custody battle for the others. Still, Yusef roams free. Callie imagined him walking the streets of Costa Rica, charming women and swindling strangers. But Digital Spy reported that Yusef moved to Nicaragua in 2019, where he served a few months for fraud and was extradited back to Denmark. He probably started life under a new name and will do it all over again. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section, what would you rather have to do for a week each day? Walk 10 miles or run two miles?